Matthew Bradney's 21st Century Reformation is a lifetime of teaching given over 15 intense sessions designed to bring you up to speed with God's kingdom and prepare you for effective ministry like only Winky can. Fasten your seatbelt, Dorothy. This is Winky Bradney. Patience and perseverance is part of the fruit of the Spirit. So you've hung in well. Okay, we're on a big subject now, which we hope will not take too long. We're looking at uh, this marvelous word, holiness. And remember, this is the word that appears over um, 650 times in the Bible. God designates his people as a holy people. Uh, Today, unfortunately, the word holy has these implications. Uh, Some of them remotely resemble the Bible idea of holy, and a lot of them have nothing whatsoever to do with it. A great deal of what people have called holiness, we could call legalism. But in Scripture, holiness is uh, is not some external regulation thing. It is the outflow of a life in love with God. So what I I want to try and do is show you, first of all, the significance and the importance of this word holy for the Christian church. To be a holy person in Bible times is to be somebody set apart for something very, very special. And we have kids who feel like they're just nothing. They have no, no identity, no value, no worth. To be called holy by God is, is like being chosen for the best team there is in the world. So um, I'm for restoring the word holy and the biblical idea of holiness to being a badge of honor in the Christian church. That when we say he's a holy man, we're not talking about some freaky person who's got their own weird idiosyncrasies that happen to be religious in nature. I've told you before that in the East, the word holy tends to mean a wise person. If you go to a holy man in the East, you don't necessarily go to a man who is morally clean. You go to a person who you hope will give you some insight, wisdom, or revelation in the nature of things. Uh, The word holy in the West has tended to mean a nice person, but usually a bit stupid. A good holy man. Sky Pilot, the song that was done during Vietnam days. He's a good holy man. It's a cynical, you know, he's all right, but he's, he's a bit stupid, but he tries hard. Have you noticed that in some of the old movies, the bad guys are always the brilliant ones and the good guys are stupid, but they sort of like trip over the lever accidentally that blows up the bad guy's castle? In the Bible, evil is stupid. Satan, when he fell, he was perfect in wisdom. When he fell, he's never called wise again. Never. Subtle, yes. Cunning, yes. A lot more data than you'll ever amass in your lifetime. Malicious, certainly. Humorless, probably. But wise, no. God equates sin with stupidity. And if you wanted a quick summary of what holiness is, it is wisdom and love expressed in a person's life. I want to talk about Christian perfection. And the reason I want to mention this is because we have such an aversion to that word. We have actually made bumper stickers on this and used that as a badge of honor for our Christianity. As a matter of fact, we have bumper stickers that say things like this. Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And it sounds cool. But one day we will have to stand before God wrapped in nothing but that bumper sticker and give an account of what we did with this word. Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So what I want to explore with you today is the biblical picture of perfection. And then you can tell me at the end of the thing whether you think this is a doable, livable thing. But I am convinced that when God says something and commands it particularly, He's not commanding something that is impossible or unwise or stupid or weird. He is saying something that's intimately connected with what is real and right and possible. And I want to show you that contrary to popular thinking, 
that the, the biblical idea of being perfect is not only something that can be done, it is absolutely necessary for growth in any field at all. I've put down as a base, the battle here is between practical and, op, uh, practical and optional consecration. If we believe that living a holy life is again some form of option, and not practical, not doable, just some theoretical weirdness, the Christian church will give up on preaching on a holy life. The greatest and closest thing we ever had to revival in this nation, other than the visit of those two Salvation Army boys that General William Booth sent out from England, was when a man called Smith Wigglesworth, you can tell he's a Pentecostal just by his name, Smith Wigglesworth came to New Zealand. The story behind it is quite amazing that a missionary was touched during the Azusa Street outpouring at the turn of the century in 1900s in Los Angeles. And that was itself a marvelous thing. When God chose a black, one-eyed preacher, he only had one eye and he was middle-aged with the unlikely name of a man with one eye as Willie Seymour. If you don't think God has a sense of humor, you can explain how he picks a a one-eyed man called Willie Seymour and gives him a vision for the world. <laughs> but uh, this missionary was powerfully touched during this time of revival. He came back. He'd labored for a long time in Asia in the particular field of ministry he was in. It had been almost fruitless. And then touched by the fire of Azusa and a whole new, brand new picture and vision of God and what it meant to really serve God, he went back and saw an awakening break out among the people that he was with. He was so excited about this. He labored, built a, a thriving church. We're not talking about a few school. We're talking about thousands of people coming to the Lord. And then on, um, on his uh, break, he had to take a break because... Um, you know, Mary had a little lamb. It was a Christian sheep. It became a charismatic and died of lack of sleep. Be because he had a break, on the, ba on the way back on the ship, he ran into Smith Wigglesworth, who was also on the ship. And he asked him, because he had had a vision of Australia and New Zealand having an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So he asked him, have you ever thought about going to Australia and New Zealand? Smith Wigglesworth said, no. He said, I had this vision about would you pray about possibly going? And Wigglesworth said, yes. So he went back. He came to New Zealand to host the meetings, but Wigglesworth missed the boat. In those days, it's like months before the next boat came. And so he eventually had to go back. He had a whole church to, to do. He went back and left somebody in his place. And, uh, when, and Wigglesworth arrived here in New Zealand, unheralded, unknown, this plumber who... Uh, seemed almost uh, basically illiterate. He only really could read one book, and that was the Bible. Showed up, uh, the guy in great faith who'd never met him, never heard him or anything else, booked the Wellington Town Hall, booked, booked the largest venue he had, and this unknown, completely unheralded guy came in walking with God, and the first meeting they had 800 people. The second meeting jammed out the town hall, and the third one, an hour before the meetings, people were running trying to get into the to the building. Those small uh, days of heaven on earth, which I have a record of in the computer, and, and the record is actually only here in New Zealand because it that was a New Zealander that did it, was never published in a major book, is some of the most astonishing scenes that ever happened in this country. There are instances of him praying with the leadership of a city and and as he begins to pray, all of the leaders, one by one, run out of the building. And the man who's supposed to be his PA and travel with him said, where are you going? They said, you can't, you can't stay there. And he said, what do you mean? He said, you, just, you can't stay there. And so he said, well, I'll stay here. And he thought, whatever happens, I'll just hang on to this. I'll hang on to the counter on my chair and I will not move. I'm his PA. I will stay there. And he said, one by one, these godly leaders from across the country prayed. And Wigglesworth with us in the corner. And then finally, tears, he began to pray and he began to pray. And he said, the intensity of the presence of God got so strong that one by one, the godliest of these leaders got up and fled the room. And he said, I stood there fighting, holding, holding on to my thing. And he said, I could not stay. I had to stand up or die and leave with the power that came into that room. And you know what Smith Wigglesworth's messages were? On holiness. How to be a holy person. I have them. 
Why don't we preach about this? Why isn't this a theme of the church like it is the theme of the Bible? I told you about this little book and how much time there is spent on that subject of repentance. What I have reprinted for you in your notes. I'll just put it like this. What is this subject? It starts, I put it all together in one shot. Starts here at the bottom of the page. Is an entire page here and still goes over the other side. That is called holding living or to follow conversion. It is a massive subject in the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's probably the major subject of the Bible. It's God is holy, the Son is called holy, the Father is called holy. Of course, the Spirit is called the Holy Spirit. God is uniquely holy. His name is holy. We're to worship Him in holiness. There's wisdom in holiness, power in holiness, joy in holiness. He creates and redeems in holiness. He judges in holiness. All of this. And we say, well, there's nothing about it. And if we do, it's usually apologetic and, oh, yes, but nobody's perfect. I'm going to have that ministry of ripping off stupid bumper stickers. I've got some good ones over there. I've got time to show you them all. One goes, smile, God is a consuming fire. <laughs> he sent Abraham, that Iraqi that became the forefather, the only one acknowledged by all three of the major religious systems as the father of the faithful. He said, I am the Lord. Walk before me and be perfect. See that? Here's what Jesus said. Be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Let me go again then simply over what holiness is. Holiness is a measure of love and wisdom. Another way of saying this is holiness is simply living up to the light you are given as it is given. It is simply doing what God says as he says it, when he says it. Holiness is not measured by somebody else. God is the one who knows how much you know. You know, some of us think we know stuff. How many of you this weekend have discovered, I knew that, but I didn't know it? Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, I knew that. It's not, none of this that I'm giving you is new. It's old stuff. But you can see it again and again and again and not see it. I don't know how many times I've been over these things where they rip me left, right, and center, and the presence of the Lord shows up again and again and again. And it's the same. So I haven't got into some, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the beast or, you know, which pope is going to be the next antichrist. I apologize for that. I'm just, I'm ripped by these awesome revelations of who he is. And that's what I intend to be doing eight billion years from now. Holiness is a measure of love and wisdom. It is infinite in him, but in us, his children, it is finite. When he's saying, be perfect, he's not saying what we... I'll tell you very quickly, I just have to say these things. He's not saying, be somebody who has never sinned. Do you see that? He's not talking about freedom from a past life of being screwed up. He's not talking about not um, making mistakes. He's not talking about not having anything more to do in growing in your life. He's not talking about any of those things. We tend to think that the word perfect or and, and its companion description, the nature and character of God is holy, is, is some sort of artificial thing. And sometimes in history, people have felt like maybe you need like a special experience with God. You're a Christian. Then you need a special experience with God. And that makes you now a holy Christian. So they kind of divide what normal Christianity is from like advanced Christianity. But he's the same God. And though he can bring various experiences in your life, and it is true that you need power to do things, and sometimes, like in the early church, when Jesus is with them, the Holy Spirit falls on their lives, and after he's gone, he comes back again. They didn't have to get saved every three weeks. But you do need the presence of God to minister. And you don't need to feel the presence of God every single moment. Some of us would like to, but then we're pretty sensual people. Feel all the time. We want feeling. 
God wants us just to live by loving him, by trusting him. When you don't get any special voices or, you know, words from this guy, this is a book. He's already talked. You shouldn't have to have some revelation from heaven whether you should sleep with somebody's wife or not. It tells you. Read it. No is the answer. Spelled N-O. What does that mean in the Greek and the Hebrew? No, that's what it means. It just means no. You shouldn't need any of these advanced revelations. As a matter of fact, when people are full of that, the Lord told me, the Lord showed me, it, it tends to make me a bit concerned because you ought not to need special guidance in order to do something for your father who you love. My boy, I haven't seen him for nearly six months now. I'll see him in a couple of weeks. I shouldn't have to send him a special revelation every day to make sure that things that is his responsibility to do. He doesn't need me to say that every day. Thou art William, my son, and a holographic picture to appear before his bed. He's a kid who loves me and I love him and we just do stuff. See that? He carries on. He, he knows what I like. He hung out with me. So he takes care of those things. He's been thrilled to tell me the library's coming on great, Dad. We repaired the leak that was in the floor of this old house that we'd moved it into and fixed it up. It's almost ready. To, you'll love it. See that? He's preparing things for me. And I didn't even tell him because he knows what I think like. That's what a Christian life is like. It's not a life that is a driven life. It's not a life of straining. Have you ever noticed a grape trying to be a grape? Grapes don't try to be grapes. They just grow. My friend Keith, who we heard some music of earlier, used to say, he is divine and you are the branches. <laughs> grapes don't strive. They just simply grow. And this is fruit, not works. Do you see that? The character of God is not a works. It is a fruit. Fruit grows. It doesn't... <clears throat> it just grows. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you the, the best, um, an analog of this perfect I can get by, by mentioning. And not, any, well, not all of this is in the notes. There's a lot of things we could say about this, but... Um, there are three words like the word holy that will help you maybe understand. The first one is the word blameless. Now, my wife's mother, and it's Mother's Day, and my, mother, and my wife is there with, um, I call her my other mother. Um, she loves flowers. She was in Switzerland with her son, David, and there's a beautiful rose bush, okay? And she loves roses, so she, like, picked one of these roses and smelled it. And then she saw in French, do not touch. <laughs> now that is not, that's wrong. Do you see that? But it's what you would call in the Bible a sin of ignorance. God's holiness or being perfect is not blamelessness. It, I mean, it's not um, sinlessness. It is blamelessness. You know the difference between the two? There is no intention to do wrong here. It is just something that has been done without intention. And even the courts of law, if, you, if you're coming around a corner carefully and some kid's chasing a ball and runs out in front of your car and gets killed, there's a big inquest. Of, were you driving safely and everything else? And then if everything is in order from your end, you are not held up for manslaughter. It's a sad thing. It's an awful thing. A child has died. You're traumatized from what has happened. But it is not sin and it is not guilt. It is instead a bad thing that happened but without intention. And our courts of law recognize the difference between unintentional and intentional. And that's rooted in biblical values. The word blameless is not the same as the word sinless. It means no intentional wrong. The second word is the word mature. Mature has to do with growth. And if, if I said that holiness in the Bible is, a, is like a combination of light and love, then you can see that a brand new Christian only has so much light. Whereas a person like some of you who have been walking with the Lord maybe 30, 40, 50, maybe longer years with God will have so much more light. 
But can you see that holiness of both of them would be on the same level? That if a brand new Christian who'd just been saved five minutes did exactly what God wanted him to, he'd be just as holy in the sight of God as a saint who'd walk with God for a hundred years, or like some of these older ones, like Methuselah, almost nine 969 years, that's a long time, almost a thousand years, that holiness is, is measured simply by the light you have. And this is God measuring, not other people. I don't know how much light you've got. You don't know how much I've got. See that? So I'm not qualified to judge your holiness. I don't know. Only God can say you're perfect. If I said it, you'd know I wasn't. <laughs> I am perfect. It just sounds arrogant, doesn't it? But what if God says it to you? What if, in fact, the devil came to God and was so ticked because he found a person who actually lived the way God wanted him to long before there was a cross or anything else? What if the devil came to God? And by the way, the devil's not a threat to God. Some of you think it's like this big fight like a Tao. You know, yin, yang, God, devil, darkness, light, life, death. It's not a yin, yang. You don't spell Jehovah, yin, yang. The devil is like this. He's short. <laughs> You've been shaking hands with a person who's short and feels like it? You know? I've shaken hands with power team people. They're scary. They've got arms like the rear end of elephants. They're... They're the ones that just snap baseball bats over their heads and break bricks with their arms and people like that. Obviously, I was never called to be part of a power team. When one of those guys shakes hands with you, you know how, how they shake hands? They shake hands very gently because if they sneezed accidentally, they'd rip your arm right off, see? So God, the greatest being, is the gentlest being. See that? The devil, on the other hand, is short. <laughs> he's like the guy that gets your hand, and when he shakes hands, he's going to break you. Oh, hello, I'm actually quite powerful, though I'm small. It's the Benjamin factor. We're the littlest, but we're bad. The devil's always wanted to be taller. <laughs> so think of this now. Mature has to do with what you know and what you're doing with what you're supposed to know. So if a baby is doing everything that a baby is supposed to do when it's a baby and there's nothing wrong at all with its, you know, the way its, its body's working and the way it's responding to things, babies are like explosions of learning. You give them a rattle and they go, sound, and they listen to it and... It's pink and it's blue or maybe both, just in case it's not sure. And it's shaking and then that's it. That's all this thing does. It tastes it. It tastes plastic and then that's it. It throws the rattle away. You go, come back. We've given you the... Now it's got the box and it's ripping that up to find an explosion of learning that's going on in the little brain. If it is doing all a newborn or a young baby's... It's a perfect baby. But if it's 23 and it's still got a rattle... There's a problem with it. The Bible idea of perfect is mature. It's, it matches the input. So can you see two things? It's not peer-reviewed. We can't review each other's holiness. I believe your holiness is at about this level here. I don't know what you know, but I know somebody who does. You can fruit inspect. If a guy comes and he's, he's full of violence, bitterness, murder, and addiction, you don't have to go, well, I'm not sure whether you're a Christian or not. It's a pretty safe bet he's not. The Bible says, can a good tree bring forth bad fruits? Can a fountain bring forth both sweet and bitter waters at the same source? After all, if you see an apples hanging on a tree, what kind of tree is it? It's called apple tree. And if you see nectarines, what kind of thing is it? Nectarine. And if you see plums, yes. And if there's bananas, yes. And what if you see nectarines, plums, bananas, and ducks hanging on a tree? <laughs> Somebody is screwing around. <laughs> the, the, the fruit shows you what the tree looks like. And this is what God says. A tree is known by its fruit. Now, isn't that obvious? 
So what if you see a person who doesn't look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, smell like Jesus, think like Jesus? He's probably not a Christian. But you can't say to that person, you are going to hell because you don't know Jesus like I do. You don't keep the books. When I lead somebody to the Lord, I don't tell them, now you're a Christian? I don't know. Only God keeps the books. So I can tell them, look, if you really give your life to God, these things you'll find happen in your life. These changes will take place. They'll be awesome. Some of them will be gradual. These are the things that you'll see. And in the full track, these are the facts which you can get on our website. The second part of it is, now that you've begun your new life, you will see these changes. And there's a set of external and a set of internal changes. A new hunger for the Word of God. You desire to be with other Christians. These things are automatic and real. It comes out of the life that God puts in your heart. Now, the third word for perfect, or a parallel word for perfect, is the word sincere. And the Latin roots of that, again, I know a little Latin because I went to a high school where it got drummed in. In science, you had to learn Latin. Okay, so I'm sorry about that, but I learned Latin. And uh, it's a Latin word. We get the English word sincere from, and it comes from two root words, sine, S-I-N-E, sine, or sine, or the emphasis on whatever syllable you want to put, which means without. And cires, which is the root word, which means wax. So if it helps you, being perfect means to be waxless. Now, what does that mean? Well, in the old days, when you were a sculptor, you took a piece of marble, like Carrera marble, like Michelangelo, and you started chipping to free the person you saw inside that thing. You saw uh, David, and you began chipping all the parts that weren't David. But if you were, uh, you know, you'd work maybe six months on this beautiful statue, and you're just working on his nose, and was a little bit there, and you went to swing with your chisel, and you sneezed, and you knocked his nose right off. And it had been six months from the creation. You spent all of this time. Well, what are you going to do? You're supposed to start again. They didn't have super glue in those days. <laughs> so what they would do, though, if you're a bit unscrupulous, is you took some wax and you mixed it with marble dust until you got it this, exactly the same color as the bit you chipped off. And in all the little holes and the imperfections and the bits you missed, you stuck this wax and you smoothed it all out and you made it look nice and then you sold it quickly. And it was great till you held it up to the light and the light would reveal where all the wax was. So being perfect means without wax. That when you held up to the light and it shines on you, what you see is what you get. Those are the three Biblical alternative words to the word perfect. And now I'm going to ask you this question. How many of you have ever worked out physically? Put your hands up. A couple of you put your hands up. You others would like to, but then you realize that you'd become proud because your muscles would be rippling as you lifted your hands. And so because this is a godly congregation of people, you felt, no, I will just not share those of you who have worked out, how do you build a muscle? Constant work. Say that. Actually, you do two things. First of all, you stress it. You don't have to stress it massively, but you stress it more than it's used to. You load it with something that's a slightly a larger weight than you're used to. And then you do your reps. Okay, You repeat that lifting or whatever it is, that's, that you repeat that stress for a period of time. What actually happens is your muscle fibers begin to break down. Then you give it a rest for a day or so. Then those muscle fibers reform stronger. How do you build a muscle? You stress it. You repeat that experience until the thing grows stronger. Okay? The problem with a good coach or a personal trainer is that he or she is given a person to work with and they are to try and figure out what that person is capable of doing. I'm a tennis player and still play tournaments and stuff. And so I have a friend called Greg who is in Tyler and he's one of the best coaches in America. He's, he constantly contributes things to international tennis magazine. And he's coached a number of juniors, little kids, 
to, to being number one ranked in the United States. He's just a really good coach. His present person he's working on is his daughter, who is very scary at this point. I watched him with, I think, an 11- or 12-year-old girl, and, and she's hitting against this guy on the other side. This is this little kid with a scary-looking set of strokes. And, and the guy fed her a ball, and she hit a, a really wussy background. And Greg comes over, and he goes, what was that? He said, girls shouldn't play tennis. <laughs> you know why you hit that wussy background? Because you're a girl. And she just went, <laughs> and the next time she hit the ball, she like belted the cover off the thing. See there? He's a good coach. What he did is he stressed her. He took her further than she thought she could go. Do you see that? Now, it is the value of a really good coach to know how far you are actually capable of doing. You can't just come to a person and go, hey, I see you running easily a two-minute mile. No problem. You've got to figure out what the person is capable of that they don't see. And then you've got to take them step by step to the place where you can. You may be wrong, in which case you'll burn them out. And that's one of the hardest things. And a book was written by one of the great, they call them psychological coaches, because there's two parts to a sport. There's the physical side and the mental side. Mental toughness is part of this thing. It's called the new toughness training. And it's the thing that makes a person go on even though nobody else thinks. It's the same kind of thing Lance Armstrong, the cyclist, had with the cancer and everything else. He still went in and he still won again and again and again. And people thought he's got to be on steroids or something. He said, I'll tell you what steroids are. And me sitting my rear end on a bike saddle and putting in thousands of hours, that's my steroids. That mental toughness that in the face of discouragement and everything else goes on. How do you develop that toughness? And here's what he said. The way you develop mental toughness is to stress the person, not terribly, just enough to lift them higher from the level they were able to do before, to repeat that until it becomes normal for them and then work on from there. A man during World War II wrote a book, a very simple and beautiful little book, and uh, it became a, a classic. It's probably less than 100 pages, so it, it's um, less than the notes you have there. It was called uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. He was a Viennese uh, psychologist, and he was interned in one of Hitler's concentration camps. And because many of his relatives were Jewish, he lived a totally terrifying life of almost every week them being lined up. And one group went into the showers and were gassed to death, and then he just missed it on this line. He saw relatives and friends one by one die in those concentration camps. And then the next thing, he was there, and then they picked the other one. And then he was in this one, and then they picked this one. And he kept missing it all the time. Being a psychologist, he, he watched people, and he saw people just break down under meaningless work. They were given rocks to carry from one end of the camp to the other. When they got them all over there, backbreaking, they were to bring them back. Meaningless work. But he said there were some people that just managed to survive somehow. He didn't understand how they somehow survived the, the, the mental pressures of a concentration camp. And if they didn't physically get sick and physically die, they would say something like this. I don't care what they do to me. By April of next year, by Easter of next year, I am going to be still alive and I'm going to walk out of this camp alive. And he said, if Easter came around next thing, they either said, okay, next Easter. Or within a couple of days or a week of that Easter coming around, they just lay down for no obvious reason, gave up and died. It is the syndrome where a man or woman is now, what do we call it now, downsizing, where, where a person has worked for a firm or something, like my brother-in-law who worked for an electrical company, which was a government thing, and then was bought privately and was downsized, and he lost his job and became a Pizza Hut manager. It is that thing where suddenly you're given a gold watch and retired, and in six months you're dead. What is it that makes people lose heart? And Frankel's little book analyzed that. He was trying to find out what is it that makes people survive. Do you know what he said? Here's the essence of it. What people 
are looking for is a stress-free life. That's what people want. I don't want any stress. He said stress is necessary. There is bad stress. There is too much stress. But he said you must always have something bigger than yourself to give yourself to that calls you to be like that or you will not be spiritually or mentally healthy. In other words, it is the goal of giving yourself to something greater than yourself that actually creates the strength and growth. My son came to me when he was littler and we were doing, we can't call it homeschooling because I'm not a good teacher. I just go study it, read it yourself, do it. Amen. Goodbye. And so he would take back his notes from school in the U.S. and he'd study it himself and set his own schedule and stuff and then go back and have to sit the test. And he came to me one day with algebra, which was a new subject from the time, and he said, Dad, let me ask you a question. What is this for? I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? He said, what, what use is this going to be to me? When will I ever get to use this stuff? I said, trust me, son, never. I read that same book. I haven't used it yet. And he said, well, why am I studying this? I said, because it will stretch the neural pathways of your brain, <laughs> taking on stuff you've never thought of before. And even though you'll never get to use this, I've got, we've both got maths programs that can do complex calculus differentials in quarter of a second. Why in the fat do we need to learn A, B, T, D? Why do we need to learn that stuff? The answer is when you take on something that you never thought about before, like paying some kind of price to come to this weekend and sit here in the heat for hour after hour, most people would just be lying on the ground dying, which is probably what you'll do afterwards. Something will happen. You'll get stretched a little bit further than where you were before. And if you're going to build a muscle, you stress it and rep it. If you build a, build a brain, you're going to stress it and rep it. If you're going to build emotions, you stress them and they grow stronger. And if you're going to build a life, you say to the people you built, be perfect like me. And he's the greatest coach in the universe because he only shows you what he knows you can do. Isn't this cool? You talk about, I have the greatest personal trainer in the universe. He knows exactly what I really can do and exactly what I really can't. Does it, does it seem strange to you when the Apostle Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? That's not he could fly around the moon 14 times. He's talking about the things that are possible for my life have come because Jesus, you can call him a coach if you like, it's actually one of the names of Christ that he's the forerunner. He's the one who ran out before and showed you how to do it. So when Jesus says to me, be like me, he says to me, be like me. A one disciple looking at Jesus said, you know, he's cozying up to him, and then he sees another disciple of Jesus, and he goes, Lord, what will this man do? And Jesus said, what is that to you? Follow me. See that? Don't you go looking at other people and comparing your life with theirs. Let me tell you something. If you, as Paul said, compare yourselves and measure yourselves among yourselves, one of two things will happen to you. You'll get either discouraged or arrogant. You'll see somebody and go, well, what a loser that person is. Well, thank God I'm not as other men. Why I tithe, I, you know. You'll, you'll begin to compare yourself with this person and go, well, that's, you know, I'm obviously much more advanced in my Christian life than this poor loser. You get arrogant. And then what if you run into somebody who's like, you know, they, they fast about 360 days a year. They've read the entire Bible in Hebrew and Greek each week before they come to Bible studies, they've pastored 1,800 churches and they're 21. <laughs> but you, you look at a person like that, you go, I'm going to kill myself, all right? I am just going to plain go and kill myself. There's absolutely no way. Do you see that? You measure yourself among yourself. That's not how God tests us. He, uh, he said, listen, listen to me. I'll tell you something. I want you to do it. You do it, that's what holiness is. 
It is a natural outflow of listening to God's voice and doing what he says. It's a beautiful, it is a simple thing. And, hear me, it is absolutely necessary for any kind of growth at all. Some of you don't want any stress. You want to lie there and just go, that's it. This is lovely. See that? And you, they will call you marshmallow <laughs> after a while. We used to have a phrase in the Jesus movement, that's really mellow. You know what mellow is? Overripe and slightly rotten. <laughs> what we need in the church is some people who have a workout. I love, um, I love the Incredibles. It's a great, great, so refreshing to see character animation where they're animated and have character. <laughs> when you look at the church and it seems dead as a doornail and people have no character. Isn't that cool to have cartoon <laughs> things with character and animation? But here's Mr. Incredible who's now developed a gut so he can hardly put on his super suit. <laughs> and when the button flies out, it'll kill anything in the room. And he can't even be popped out of the tube to be dropped easily on the island to stop the monster robot from taking over the island. So he's working out. You know, he, you know, what is he doing? He's stressing more than he's used to to get in shape for the real fight. That is what Jesus requires of his church who would please him who is chosen us to be a soldier you go into the military they drill you i don't mean they hold you they may <laughs> scary people in the military now okay <laughs> I'm not doing that but the drill what do they do they they say take your gun to take your rifle to bits take it this is what we used to teach you do it in the dark do it so well that you know how to assemble a thing in the why is that because when the enemy's coming, you can't go, oh, which end do I hold? What is a bullet? And where do I put it? <laughs> Why do they march? Army people, yeah, march. What is this? Is this a dance? Are you going to dance with the enemy? What is the point? They train you in the army, stress you. They take you beyond things that you think you can possibly do. Why do they do that? Because in times of stress, it is now possible for you to function normally. You can take it when suddenly all hell is breaking loose and everybody else is freaked out of their mind. You have a task to do, and it is now automated into your system. You can pick up your gun. You can put it together without thinking. It is so part of you now, you don't even have to think. It is an automated, re automated response to that terrible rush that could cost you your life if you make a mistake. And the drilling and all of that thing is all built in order to teach you to be perfect. The army takes mottos. Be a Marine in the U.S. That's the cool thing. We had two Marines in one of the ministries I was in. They were number two and three in the Marine Olympics. Actually, they were Navy SEALs, which is the elite Navy guys. They built us an obstacle course like the Navy one, for our workouts in the morning before we had Bible study. That is the single most terrifying thing I've ever been on. They had a rope that went up higher than this roof. It looked like, at least to me, who's, I told you about my terrifying of heights. It was a rope net. I don't know if you know this, but when you climb up a rope net, it moves. Every time you make a move, it goes like this. See that? And they have set it at the precise psychological height of maximum terror. If you went any higher, you would not feel any more afraid than the top of that thing. And this is what they say, up over the rope. So I went up. I got at least three feet. And it's like this. It's safe. It's not going to break. But you may. And I got to the very top. This was achievement for me. And I could not get over. My hand went, no, 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 no. Absolutely not, no way. Now I watch some of these extreme guys, okay, well, you know. <laughs> and after you've done it 400 times, the wall is nothing. See that? What do you think God wants of his church? 
Is he going to say to you, hey, just cruise? I want you like me. I want you to be the best you can possibly be. And I'm the only one who can tell you what that is. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Let me ask you a question. Is that doable? Not if we do this comparison thing. Not if we measure ourselves among ourselves. But looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The shepherd goes before the sheep. He does what he asks the sheep to do. He is like that. Though he were a son, or we could say more than that, the son, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. We think suffering is a curse, and it is a consequence of the fall. But suffering is what happens when an Olympic athlete is taking his body to heights nobody's ever dreamed of before. I, watch, I love watching Russian weightlifters because I know I will never be one. <laughs> and have you ever seen this expression I have? Like, you know, Boris, whatever it's, Karloff, whatever it's, he comes out and this, this, the ends of the weights are bigger than him and the bar is like this and he, and he, gets, <clears throat> and he grabs it you know, and then he lifts and the thing goes <laughs> like this. Have you seen his face? It's not like, okay, no sweat. He's like, <laughs> like this, he's got to hold it. Every muscle, every, his eyes are sticking out like, come the butt, like this. And then he drops it. And you have never seen such joy and rejoicing when he does it. He hugs everybody, whether they're Russian or not, <laughs> because... He gave it his best, and it worked. So God looks at his kids. He wants them to fly. He wants them the absolute best they can be. And I think that this country deserves to see somebody who really loves God. I'm committed to loving him. I'm committed to hanging in and listening to his voice and doing whatever he says. Have I screwed up? Many, many, many times. I haven't a calculator, could not handle it. But here's a little secret that happened to me. In my early days, I was a brand new Christian. I got involved in Youth for Christ quizzing. Now, I don't know if this was a, almost a demonic thing, but it really wasn't. It was, a, it was a Bible quizzing thing. And what we had to do is to learn entire books of the Bible. And then in, uh, in Auckland... Uh, they invented electric chairs. I don't mean that if you failed the test, they killed you, because that would be a bit extreme. But what they did is they had these chairs with micro switches in them uh, connected to a digital switch that the first person who triggered the micro switch would shut off all the other things. So in our quizzing, we not only memorized everything we could think of, um, we, you, the point was you sat in these chairs and a quiz master would ask you a question out of these books of the Bible and what you had to do is the moment you thought you knew the question that he was asking, you jumped. And then if you got off your chair before anybody else did, your light lit up and the quiz master asked you the question. If you couldn't get the question right, then he gave it to the other team. So I, I gave it my best shot. I took all my chemistry background, <laughs> memorized all these things, and we were not jumping for answers. If anybody had been given a quiz, we would have all got 100% in our team. We were really cool. We were jumping for questions. So we wrote hundreds of questions, exercise books full of questions, every kind of question we could think of about that field. We went through these questions, quizzed each other, and we jumped physically. We actually put carpenter's aprons on, filled them up with nails, had honey drinks and stuff like this, and practiced with weights. Just so when you took the weights off, you would fly off that seat. See? So we did all of this because we're coming against Wellington, which was our big rival in those times. Not rivalry in the Christian church, of course, we know that, but still it was. Anyway, we are there. I'm like 18 years old, and... Uh, there's different sheets. I walked into the YFC office one time and lying on a desk was some, picked up some questions and it was typewritten, which is a bit unusual, but I read through some of the things I'd seen. I thought, well, that's a cool way to ask the thing. I, it, I didn't think much about it. Two weeks later, um, our team, the Auckland team, 
I was up against Wellington. There were 2,000 kids in this auditorium, and I'm sitting there like this. And the quiz master, it's all tie, tuxedo things, very big deal, see? Wellington kids had traveled a couple of days to get up there. And the quiz master says, where did, and I <coughs> jumped, and he said, finish the question. I get, where did Abraham come from? And he goes, that's right. And that, you know, Al Walkland goes crazy. Wellington goes, oh, no. And then, and then the next one. From which, and I'm again, I got three in a row. And on the third time, suddenly something occurred to me. I have heard these questions before and seen them in this order. And I suddenly realized the sheet I had read was the final quiz questions of the National Quiz Championships. Now, what you're supposed to do is go, stop, stop. I've seen these. We must disqualify our team. But there's 2,000 people and half of them are Auckland and they would kill you. <laughs> so if it helps you, I jumped more slowly. <laughs> and if it really helps you, probably in the justice of God, we lost that night. It shows you how awesome Wellington was. It's all the brethren they had there. <laughs> but when I went back that day and I was um, going to do some leadership things in YFC, I don't think it was the devil, but a, a small, small acquaintance of his. And this is what he said. You cheated. On a Bible quiz. How demonic is that? <laughs> cheat on a Bible quiz. You want to be a minister and you cheat on a Bible quiz. may sound silly now, but for me, I said, that's right. How can I be a Christian and cheat on a Bible quiz? And then you go to meetings, and everybody asks, what a wonderful meeting. And the heavens are brass, and you pray, and no answer. But he's going, God bless you. Did you enjoy the meeting? And, yeah, no, not really. <laughs> and you slink off into the night. And it may seem strange, but 10 days later, I was packing my bags and going back to my career. I had uh, simply decided it's not God's problem, it's not God's fault, but some people just can't make it. And I'm one of those people. I wasn't going to go and tell people I was into Christianity, tried it, didn't work. I wouldn't ever dare say that. I knew it wasn't his problem, it was mine. So I was just getting ready to pack up and leave and be a nice, safe chemist again and go back to the things that I'd trained for for all that decade before. And I don't know what happened. I can't say it was a vision, but I had a very vivid picture suddenly in my mind. It was an Olympic stadium. It was huge. I don't know how, it looked like 100,000 people in this huge stadium. And somehow, I was, it was almost like a traveling camera. The place was just jammed with people. And they, they, would, they were watching. And into the stadium came a single runner. And he was obviously leading a field that had been on some long run. And now it was the f final lap. And the person began to run, and it was almost like a camera, and I kept zeroing in on this person, and I was looking at his feet, and he had a running shoe, and he was running, and there was mud along the side of the track, but he had his shoelaces unlaced on one shoe, and it was slapping in the mud, and I saw it, and I knew he was going to do it, and he did, though he was way, way out, and the rest of the field had just come into the auditorium, and people were cheering and yelling. He stepped suddenly on his his sh loose shoelace, and he went smack, just like somebody hit him in the face with an axe. He went smack on his face in the mud, and he like that. And then he tried to pull himself out, and I just saw his eyes through the mud, and he looked down to see what had happened. He saw his track shoe, and he began to weep. And these tears went straight down through the mud, leaving two white tracks on his cheeks. And he just sat there on the side of the thing, pointing to his shoe, and crying. And behind him came this rest of the field. And you should have seen. I couldn't hear them, but I saw them. They're going like this. Do you know what they were saying? And he's going. <laughs> and I thought, what are you stupid? Get up. The race isn't over. God said yes. So I got up, tied my shoelace, and I got back in the race. 
and I've been running ever since. <laughs>